FGM. Mm -hmm. What brought you to that personally? Um, I went through FGM myself when I was one week old, and I was forced into a marriage here in New York at the age of 15. From a young age, I didn't know what FGM was, but when I got married, I realized what this practice was. And when I had my daughter, to me, saying that my daughter will not go through FGM wasn't enough. It was about the millions of girls who experience FGM. 6,000 girls are cut every single day. And saving my own daughter from it, living through a practice that's as horrendous as FGM, saving my own daughter is just not enough. And I knew that it takes women like me who have experienced this practice to stand up and say enough is enough. And that's the reason why I started the campaign, not only here in the United States, but we've managed to change laws in this country. We've managed to change laws in the Gambia. And I feel like with every single person caring about this issue, it's possible to end FGM. Masi, you are trying to bring awareness around articles of faith, specific, specifically here, the hijab and how this has affected many women and girls, not only here in the United States, but of course around the world. What you want to do is say, let's give choice. That's true. Uh, let me begin from my uh, personal experience. I grew up in a small village to a traditional family, and I was forced to wear hijab from the age of seven, like millions of other girls in my own country. Because according to the law, if you do not wear the compulsory hijab, then you won't be allowed to get an education. You won't be allowed to get a job. And you won't be allowed to live in your own country. So you have to carry the country on your shoulder and go somewhere else, which is not easy. So I'm a woman from Middle East. So I carry the scars of war. I carry the scars of revolution. I carry the scars of sanction. I carry the scars of discrimination. And I cannot keep silent. So I started a campaign called My Stealthy Freedom because I used to be the victim of not having freedom of choice. But when I found myself and when I started to talk about it, then I felt, I felt I'm strong enough. And as far as you fight against right, right. compulsion, so you're not a victim. I published a picture of myself on my Facebook page with my, as you see, too much hair. And I said, every time when I feel the wind through my hair, it just reminds me of the time when my hair was like a hostage in the hands of Iranian government. Let's enjoy it. That was all. And then I really didn't expect that I'm gonna get bombarded by pictures of women trying to dance, trying to you know, feel the wind through their hair. Right. The, the picture just started my stealthy freedom movement. It's not me. So my campaign, it's about those women who exist in Iran. For years and years and years, as we've, I've been fighting against compulsory hijab, so, and saying that Iran is beautiful. Iran is like my family, like my mother who wears hijab, like my sisters who wears hijab, but we want to have the same freedom. We want to walk shoulder to shoulder in Iran without getting arrested by morality police and telling us what to wear. What have you heard in, because your social media campaigns have, you, as you've just described, been very, very successful, bring a lot of energy and a lot of outlet, right? Uh, as simple as you were saying as being able to feel the wind in one's hair. What has been, if you will, your informal response when they said, when you asked basically the question, if you had the choice, would you wear the hijab? What would you, what was that, what's the balance would you say? Yes and no. Um, let me be honest, it was not for me growing up in a traditional family easy to take off my headscarf even in the West because I grew up with this and I thought it's part of my body, it's part of my identity. So it, it took two years even for myself to take it off and I still feel that I'm a good person. But I am for choice. I don't want my mom to get bad judgment, bad look, in France by those people who uh, judge people from what they're wearing. And I don't want to get myself into trouble by taking off my scarf. So what I'm fighting is for freedom of choice. I get often this question that, um, so you're against Islam. 
you're against those women who are wearing hijab, or you're promoting Islamophobia. But let me be clear, in my country, in Islamic Republic of Iran, I have nothing to do with Islam. But all the Sharia law, all the Islamic rules, they are against me and millions of women inside Iran. From the age of seven, we have to cover ourselves and come out with a fake identity. We are not allowed to ride a bicycle. It's considered to be a sin, uh, sinful and haram activities. Women are not allowed to be a president. Women are not allowed to be judged. I said president, so don't look for a, an Iranian Hillary Clinton yet. So women are not allowed to sing solo. Women have to fight to get the custody of child. All the marriage laws, divorce laws, all are in favor with men. So in the Middle East, the law allow men to think that they are the owner of women. I'm independent of, enough. And I, let me tell you, more than 60% of university places are made up by women in Iran. And now think about it. These educated women every day should be worried about what they want to wear. Why? Because they might get arrested by the morality police. Humiliation, discrimination. So it's not about a piece of cloth. It's about my identity and it's about my dignity. So what have you heard, very quickly, and I want to move over to Jaha, uh, what have you heard though in, in your social media channels and as you've been out meeting people when you say, I want you to have choice. Yeah. Uh, what is the choice generally been? Yes, I would like to wear the hijab, or no, I would not like to. Just, just quickly. I mean, is, sure. is it 50-50? I, and, and I, I don't care about 50-50 or if there are one woman who do not want to wear a job, right. I stand for that woman. I care about minority. So I don't care about the statistics. Because look, here when Donald Trump says that let's kick out all the Muslims, I stand for those women. When in France they say that let's just take off this headscarf from you know, those Muslim women, I stand for those women. I stand for freedom of choice, and I don't care what kind of number, 50, 50, or even one woman. Women are mature enough to choose for their own. So let's just talk about those backward laws or those, uh, you know, shameful people with small minds. Because I get often this question that riding a bicycle, wearing a job, these are a small issue. I am not fighting against, I'm not against fighting for having small activities. I am fighting against those small mind governments who are thinking now that in 21st century, they are the one that, you know, have to make decisions for women. So the, let me be honest, I really don't care about the, the, the statistics. Got it, got it. And I'm for choice. Can I say something? I, I wasn't sure what you, go, please, please go. I was born to a very, um, conservative Muslim family. My father is an imam, and he built one of the biggest mosques in where I grew up. Growing up, I never wore the hijab. Even here in the United States, if I don't wear the hijab on a daily basis. I wear it when I want to, and I don't wear it when I want to. Mm -hmm. And that's every single woman in my family. And as someone that was raised Muslim, there's no compulsory in Islam. The governments that are making the laws and telling women what to do, they are doing that because most of the time they're dictators and they're choosing what women should be like. And I don't think that's religion. I feel like when we define religion, when we talk about laws being forced on women and the morality police, they're doing that because of their own egos. I feel like with this generation, men have translated religion into what they want it to be, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam, whether it's Judaism. People have taken religion and turned it into something and translated it into their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. But if you know your religion, and that's why I advise women of faith, women that are from the Muslim community, to make sure they are reading for themselves, to make sure they know what their rights are. I will never be forced to do something that I don't want to do. My father has never forced me to wear a hijab. He has never forced any of his children to wear a hijab. But I know that's not the same for women in Saudi. It's not the same for women in Iran. And I think that's why what uh, Masi is doing, it's good to tell those women that it is their choice. Whether you want to strip naked, whether you want to wear clothes, whether you want to wear a headscarf. For me, when I wear the headscarf, it's about my own spirituality. 
It's about my own identity of who I want to be. And when I choose not to wear it to show my hair, and I do that on occasion, mm -hmm. and people ask me, Jaha, why can't you make up your mind about wearing the hijab? And I tell them, because I don't want to make up my mind. It's the choice that I want to live with. Right. There are days when I feel like I look better wearing a hijab, depending on what I'm wearing. Sure. And that's the look that I go for. Right. And there are days when I feel like my hijab does, doesn't work with whatever outfit I'm wearing, so I leave it at home. And I want people to understand that it's a I, choice. I think you have a supporter uh, sitting next to you on that. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, let, me, let me be honest. Even her hijab is too revealing for my government. So she's right. I mean, we both of us, we have the opportunity right. to talk and stand shoulder to shoulder and fight for choice. But those government even did not allow her to support us. So in my campaign, there are a lot of women wearing hijab and saying that I believe in hijab, but I hate compulsory hijab. Right. But the, the, the thing is, the government of Iran always want to say that this is coming from religions and there are a lot of Muslim people outside Iran, even the Western media, they uh, trying to keep us silent because they think if we talk against compulsory hijabs, we're talking against Islam. That is why I make it clear and I'm loud enough to say that if you want to show the moderate face of Islam, it's you. So you have to join us and you have to condemn compulsory and any discrimination which is happening in the name of Islam. I was a mother. I had to fight according to the Sharia law to have the custody of my child. I have to fight. I mean, according to the Sharia law, I am not allowed to travel uh, without getting permission from my, hus uh, from my husband. And I'm not allowed to get an education, to get a job, or to get a passport without getting permission from my husband. Of course, women are in Iran, they are open-minded, they're really progressive, the society, they're fighting for their rights, they don't care what the law tells them what to do. Every day they break the law because they want to make the bad law a respectable law. Yes, I see this, the society are more progressive, but the law is still there. The law doesn't give me uh, the same rights as men. So we have to change and tell the government, even those uh, you know, moderate Muslim, they have to be as loud as when they condemn Burkini ban to condemn compulsory hijab as well. So I always welcome Muslim people around the world to join my campaign and be loud enough to say that the government of Iran or any country, Saudi Arabia, they force compulsory hijab, you're causing Islamophobia, not those women who are fighting against compulsion. Jaha, how do you talk to those who might be in that space of discussing you know, families around the world uh, fathers and mothers that say, should we go through this process of FGM with our daughter? And, and normally it's 15 years or younger, right? That's, that's the, the, the general time that this happens. For instance, there was a, a study which you and I were talking about earlier in Sudan with a mainstream movie, basically a, a popular uh, soap, soap erratic, if you will, movie that had the parents not as the main topic, but as a subplot that was about a third or a fourth of the plot where they discussed FGM. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that when it was discussed in, as a part of raising kids, mm -hmm. it was actually raised more awareness and more fairness mm -hmm. and more concern about their daughters uh, getting FGM. They were more open to the fact they don't have to get it. Yeah. So, so how do we talk about this? It, you would never think that when we talk about FGM that it would be as soft, as you, if you will, as that, it's normally very much yes or no, no or yes. So I went back to Gambia for the first time since I moved to the United States in 2014. And early in 2015, while I was in the Gambia campaigning against FGM, my father's youngest wife delivered a baby. And it was a girl. And as soon as I received the call that my, I have a new baby sister, I went to my house because before her, Every single girl in my family had gone through FGM. And when I went, I sat down with my father and I had an open conversation with him about what FGM is and how it affected me as a woman and why this tradition needed to stop. And I think to him, it was just something that he never discussed. And as a man, he was very naive and didn't know how FGM affected women right. or his daughters. Right. And once he saw that, once he understood that, he decided to save that girl, and baby Khadija became the first girl in my family to not experience FGM. And I've seen that time and time again mm. throughout my travel, throughout my work. When I talk to men, when I talk to parents about what FGM is, 
Once they see how this affects their wives, once they understand how this affects their daughters, men want their wives to enjoy sex as much as they do. They don't want women to lay there not having the same feelings as they do. And fathers don't want to hurt their daughters. And I think that's why education is so important. That's why outreach is so important. And that's why with my work, I try to open that dialogue. I try to talk to people through radios. We go out on TV to make sure that people hear what we have to say, to make sure that communities understand the and, harmful and, effects of FGM. And, and so in families, how do they talk about FGM tr traditionally? Because you've been out there and you, you've discussed this with families. Is it, is it something that's not discussed much at all and it just happens? It's not. And in a lot of countries where FGM is practiced, they see anti-FGM movements as a Western movement, mm. as white people trying to tell us that our cultures are not good, our cultures are not bad. But I think the shift has been when you have women like me leading that campaign, and we go back to our communities, we speak the same languages, we look the same, and it's something that we've lived through. Mm. You can't argue with something like that, and I think that's been the difference. Hmm. And how does this parallel? Oh, that was fantastic. I knew that, I knew that, that you have a parallel here, Masi. Let's, let's stay in that lane. Yeah, I tried not to be loud. I know that I'm so loud. Sorry about this. But don't, don't apologize. <laughs> um, let me start from an example. Just last week, there was a US uh, female chess champion who were qualified to go to Iran to attend in a tournament. So according to, law, to the law of Iran, she has to wear compulsory hijab. So she refused. Then it means that she's going to lose the championship. She said that I stand for my own right. Some people say that when we fight against compulsory hijab, we're trying to ask the Western people to save Iranian. It's wrong, because there are millions of Iranian women inside Iran. They are fighting against compulsory hijab, and they're trying to make the Western people understand that compulsory hijab is not part of our culture. Compulsory hijab, it's not an internal matter as far as the government of Iran forcing each of you, if you decide to go and visit my beautiful country, you will be forced to wear hijab. So it's something about you. And you cannot say that this is a culture, you know, coming from uh, Iranian people, and we have to respect the Iranian culture, because forcing a girl to wear hijab cannot be part of our culture. You might be kidding me. And now they're attacking this uh, US chess champion you are trying to do the white savior. You're trying to rescue Iranian women. And I always say, when I go to media, as I said, I grew up in a small village. I am coming among those people. I respect freedom of choice. I respect my mother who wears a job. I am one of those people from, you know, within the society and trying to um, make awareness. And I always say that we never ask the female politician and come to Iran and save Iranian women. We want to save the Western women because they are lost now. They think that compulsory job is part of our culture and they want to respect the culture. And we want to tell them that it's against your own dignity. Every year, there are millions of tourists and female politicians. They go to my country and they don't dare to challenge the compulsion. So the female politician saying that, no, we go there, we want to talk about politics, we want to talk about bigger issues, let's respect the, the, the culture and not break the law or interfere in internal matter. It's wrong, because when they don't even let you to make a small decision for your own self, that how are you going to solve the bigger problems? It's wrong, because female politicians, when they ignore us fighting against compulsory hijab and wear compulsory hijab, that allows the Iranian women, uh, government right. to put more pressure on us. Jaha, where would you put the fight against FGM from one to 10? 10 means it's strong and doing very, very well. One means it's, it has a long way to go. Where would you put it from one to 10? I think at a three. A three, and where would you put this awareness of choice with the, the wearing of articles of faith like the hijab? One to 10, 10 meaning you're doing really, really well, one, you have a long way to go. I give 10 to Iranian people. Why? Because through Iranian state TV, all you see is just women in hijab. But Iran is for all Iranians. Those women who wear hijab and those women who do not want so, to wear hijab. So, so I give 10, 10 because through social media, what, you will see the true face of What Iran. about around the world? 
around the world, I give them zero. You give them zero. I give for zero to questions. Western women because they, they never even understand that this is against their own dignity. Right, right. Uh, Jaha, please, you're going to react. I don't, personally, I don't think, um, I think we need to make it very clear when we talk about um, what's happening in Iran. It's because that's a dictatorship. It's a, the a theocratic exactly. structure. Exactly. What they're doing to their people, it's wrong. And that's not Islam. It's not religion. It's just like when you think about a lot of countries in Africa where they're deciding what happens and they refuse to change law where young girls are forced to get married at the age of 13, where 90, over 90% 90 of women are subjected to female genital mutilation and we refuse to change laws to protect those girls. We are not doing it because of religion. FGM is one issue where there's a lot of myths, and one of the myths is, is a religious obligation. But we've proven time and time again that this is not a religious obligation. And it takes me back to that point when you have people saying that men have turned religion into what favors them. FGM doesn't favor the woman, it favors the man. And same thing as compulsory hijab. Is men's selfish need to control women, to control women's sexuality, to control how women dress? And that's in every society. It's happening right here in the United States, where we are telling women whether they can get an abortion, right. how they can do with what happens to their body. Slippery slope. So it's a global issue of us controlling women, controlling the woman's body, controlling the woman's identity. And I think we need to, yes, we need to take a stand against mm -hmm. that. It doesn't matter where it's happening around the world. It's our responsibility as human race yeah. to stand up and say no to that. But I think it's an issue with the Iranian government. It's the issue with the Saudi government, not allowing women to drive all of that. I, I want you both to help me with this now, uh, because it's often a difficulty that we have in news, at least, which is to communicate very complex and serious issues in short amount of time, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna walk down Fifth Avenue when we're done with this to go over to Rockefeller Plaza. And if I bump into somebody and I want to talk to them about FGM, in the one minute I've got, what do I tell them? You tell them that this is not an African issue. It's not an issue the Western people shouldn't care about. It's a human issue. And it's all of our responsibility to make sure that FGM ends. FGM, it's something that's lifelong and you can't change it once you put a girl through it. There's physical damages to her body, there's psychological damages. She lives with that trauma for the rest of the, her life. And having her clitoris and having her body intact is her God-given right, and no one has a right to take that away from her. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are, it doesn't matter where you come from. There's a difference between wrong and right, and FGM is wrong, and it's all of our job to do something about it. I took notes, and I'm gonna remember that. <laughs> uh, Masi to you as well. I'm walking down Fifth Ave here, I got 60 seconds. Again, very complex issue. What is the 60 seconds I do talk, I say to this person that has no idea what we're talking about? You know, be loud against compulsion and tell the rest of the world that women in the Middle East, especially in Iran, they are not victims, they are fighters. And when they, when they manage to raise their voices against compulsion, so do not consider compulsory job as a cultural matter because it's, compulsion is not part of a culture when you force somebody to do something. And do not say that we are not going to break the law and challenge compulsory job in Iran because slavery used to be legal. If no one objected against slavery, nowadays slavery could have been with us. So I want you to tell the rest of the world, compulsory hijab, it's an internal matter. It's not an internal matter. It's a global issue. Why? Because the government of Iran forced all women to wear hijab. So it doesn't call white savior. It called sisterhood. It called women solidarity. And it stands for your own dignity. Great. Uh, now I've got two sheets that I have to remember <laughs> and set to memory here. Then I follow up and I ask, what is one thing I can do? What is one thing I can do? That's what the person asks me. And again, I have 60 seconds. What's the one thing I can do? Stand for uh, women. And stand should for I go to your course. site? Should I go to, what should I do? I'm, I want to do something. I, I want to actually, you know, bootstrap. In America, go. let me be honest. Go to all people when we talk against restrictive Sharia laws. Tell them, do not keep us silent because of, you know, 
what Donald Trump has been doing. Because always when we talk about all the Sharia law, which is against women in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, they always say that, shh, you're causing Islamophobia. This is, you know, going to ruin the Islam's face. We are not talking against religion, but if you want to show the moderate face of Islam, it's your responsibility to join us and condemn anything which is happening in the name of Islam in my own country. How do I do that? What do I, where do I go? What, Don't what be it? scared of being labeled that you're creating Islamophobia. So talk to people is what you're saying. Talk to people and stand for freedom of choice and ask your politicians, yeah. especially female politicians, yeah. when they go to Iran, do not say that so hijab is required by right law. Break the law. Write our politicians. Anybody open for any of these two things? Okay. The female politician. All right, nobody's uh, saying yes or no as of yet. They're still waking up, it's a Saturday. Uh, what about you, Jaha? What is the, now that person says to me, what can I do? And again, all I have is 60 seconds. What do I say? Take action. Get yourself knowledgeable about what FGM is. Visit our website. It's www.safehandsforgirls.org. We have a lot of information about FGM. We currently have petitions going on. And stand with us, tweet about it. Make sure that you're telling someone else who doesn't know what this practice is. And there's a lot of organizations that are working on the issue of FGM. If you can support them, it would be great to support the work that's being done because I believe that the people on the ground that are doing this work deserve as much support as possible. So yes. So we understand how this oh, is. No, definitely this visit is... my Stop the Freedom campaign page as well because you see the voice coming from Say inside Iran. Say it again. Okay, go and visit my Stealthy Freedom, which is a page on Facebook, okay. and see the true face of Iranian women. You can understand that how they put themselves in danger because it's a punishable crime no. for them, but they want to be heard. Just go and hear their voices. We're sending videos and photos from inside Iran. Then you will understand what you can do. So both of you have articulated so well how this is about gender equality. This is about voices of those who are yeah. being affected, right? Those being able to have choice, being able to speak out. And we're talking about women here all around the world, and girls. Yeah. And we just finished the International Day of the Girl last yeah. week. Yeah. So we have a lot of powerful, strong, very uh, uh, clear and articulate women around the world. And, and girls, what do you say to the girls around the world that you can do this, this is your voice, this is what you're both saying, and this is for you? What would you say to them? I think um, I would want young women and young girls to understand that their body is perfect the way it is. God created us just perfectly, and there's nothing wrong with any part of our body. And I want young women to know that they should never be pressured to undergo something like female genital mutilation. It's not right, and it shouldn't happen. We can stop it, but it takes us to stand up and say, this ends with us. I want to tell all the especially young girls to understand that never allow men to make decisions for you, never respect bad laws, and never keep silent when you see a girl putting herself in danger to speak out, be her voices, and always be proud of your own identity. Never have the fear to be your true self, because if you just strong and can defend your own self, then you can be another voice for those people who manage to raise their voice, but they do not have any media in their own country, and show your solidarity with other girls around the world who are fighting to have basic rights. Uh, good stuff. Uh, now, let's talk about the other side of the, the ledger here. Uh, that would be young boys and, and men around the world. Good we, point. And, we, and we've, <laughs> we've got them here today, too, and as a he for she champion, I have to Yay. ask, how important oh, yeah. is the other side of the ledger here to bring them along to help you do what you're doing? So when I look at my team, both in Africa and here, half of my team is men, or sometimes even more than half of my team hmm. can be men. Wow. Yeah. And to me, the young men that campaign with me have become more passionate than the young women that are on my team. When we travel, I remember when I was in the Gambia and the CIA, which is like the version of the CIA in the Gambia, came and picked me same, up in my same office. Letters, uh -huh. And one of the young men, Mohammed, followed me. And even though it was the scariest experience, he wouldn't leave me. And he stood there by me, and they ended up getting the nickname, everyone calls them Jaha's bodyguards. It's just how passionate they are. You will find them talking to people about FGM, and they cry to the point of talking about FGM. And this is not a women's issue. It's a human issue. It takes all of us to make sure that change happens. 
like the president of the Gambia, being able to convince him to change the laws against FGM. It takes fathers to change their mind because a lot of times it's the men that we are doing FGM for. We're not doing it for the favors of women. We're not doing it because. Yeah, well, well I, I try to avoid the, you know, I'm not. I'm not but I like on. seeing yeah. two. So know, out. Yeah, we're not like looking to, you know, have a creed de corps against Trump, but feel free to do it. <laughs> 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 they, they clearly don't want that. But, like, I get slightly but, ill now. I, watch, I, I, I try to watch really? the news and I go, God, I can't watch this yeah. anymore. I get really uncomfortable. Right. So bad. It's, but it's almost a. Uh, I have a psych background, and I can tell you he is definitely narcissistic a narcissistic disorder. Sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the ghost the ghost writer of yeah, his book, The Art of the Deal, described him as a sociopath. Like he came out completely denouncing him. It's, so remote, it's in, true. Girl, because they are unclean. They're not woman and not this. They are not that. But now we have the men, and we call them the we men. Like women, they keep we men. We men, that's mm -hmm. what we. And to say that, yes, I will. his wife or his mother without a job, that means this is, he's a dishonorable man. Mm. So I tried to actually make a joke about this on social media. It didn't work. But I pointed out that the, the government always say that uh, you're dishonorable men. And the government always say that if women do not wear their hijab, men cannot control themselves and men can get excited. So it's an insult to you. And then they joined us. And I asked them to wear hijab and think about it only for one hour. Wear the hijab and think that you are forced to wear it every day. And I received a lot of pictures from men standing to their wives, mothers, sisters, wearing hijab and the women were unveiled and saying that, yes, I am a dishonorable man, but I stand for my wife's right. And I don't want to force my wife, my sister, my mother, to wear what I hated to wear it by force. So these men, which the hashtag called men in hijab, they send their videos. One of the video got 16 million views and it made awareness and it made it clear to the rest of the world that even men are educated in Iran and they don't want to force women to wear a job. So this is the law which, you know, trying to brainwash uh, the men and saying that if you allow your female relative to come out, you are dishonorable. So I think, as she said, it's, it's really important to make this clear that this is a human rights issue. This is not about women. And it's an insult to men when the world thinks, right. okay, if we go to Iran, we are not safe because men can get excited if we don't cover our hair. So men joined us in men in hijab hashtag. Unfortunately, and I could sit up here with the two of you for another hour, and I think all of you can too. There's so much, so much energy up here. <laughs> Uh, but we have to finish, and a lot like that conversation I'm going to have when I walk up Fifth Avenue, the person will then ask, well, why should I do this? And then I want you to tell me in 60 seconds what is inspiring you to say because there's so much hope. What is that answer to why you see there's hope behind what you're fighting for in 60 seconds? I started my organization in 2013. We changed laws in the United States. We made it illegal to transport girls out of this country for the purpose of FGM. I went back to the Gambia in October of 2014. In November of 2015, the government banned FGM. That's hope to me. That shows that it's possible. Globally, I strongly believe now more than ever that we can end FGM in our generation. I know that I will be alive when we see this. Foot binding used to be a thing in China. But when, we, when they wanted to end it, they did it in 10 years. And this is one issue I feel like if we all care enough, we can end it. From the beginning when I launched my Stealthy Freedom, the Iranian state TV was uh, attacking me and saying that Masi Alinejad was raped in London. Why? Because she undressed herself. So to them, talking about freedom of choice means that you get raped and it's your fault. But now there are millions and millions of women they un, you know, unveiled and saying that that doesn't mean I'm a bad woman. And now the rest of the world know about 
compulsory job is not part of Iranian culture. And the US chess champion said that, I'm not going to wear it. I have respect for Iranians. I have respect for those people who choose to wear hijab, but I'm not going to accept to be forced to wear hijab. And now, in Iranian state TV, they created a lot of show about hijab, and they use the term compulsory hijab. Before that, they were using that hijab is an order from God, but they're trying to talk about compulsory hijab. And that means this is the victory of those women inside Iran who started to talk about hijab. So we are not the victims. We are the fighters, and we have the hope that one day compulsory hijab is going to be gone, and the history will be proud of those ordinary women inside Iran who stand up for their own rights. Well, let's stand with Jaha and Masi and give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great.